we are live. What's up, everybody? Keist, first, always. So let's talk about some of the big factors around training. I've got my notebook out here, my peak performance planner, and I want to lay out a couple big factors um, just around, you know, we, we've been getting these these comments of like, what's the easiest way to get stronger? And I've, I've even seen some other influencers doing like, uh, the simplest, you know, simplest workouts or whatever, which I think those videos I freaking love, dude. I think they're fun. Um, and even where we've talked about recently, like, Hey, if you just front squat all the time, or you back squat all the time, um, you can get really, really strong. And so what I wanted to bring up was a little, a simple story, um, basically going around, um, mechanical tension okay and going around volume and if if we look at mechanical tension and and volume and we look at how our body grows we can look at simple methods of increasing volume increasing mechanical tension which in turn is going to lead to strength and so i like to use two different examples okay so bear with me we got two examples we got a, this kid that came and he trained at our gym okay his name doesn't matter. Let's call him farm kid. Okay. Farm kid here, uh, was a kid that by the time he was 14 or 15 years old, you know, he was a two time all state football player, two time all state, uh, wrestler. And he was also one of the best shot players in the state and barely would ever train. Okay. So this kid was good at anything. Okay. But grew up on a farm, basically would wrestle pigs and, uh, you know, just do all this crazy farm stuff. All right, and then we've got this kid over here that I'm gonna will will actually use as a great example, Lonnie Walker. You can look him up. He I think he plays for the Lakers now. He went he was with the Spurs. Uh, I don't remember who he plays for now, but he's from our hometown here in Reading. And so I'm using these two examples to demonstrate the value of volume and value of tension. Okay, and so tension is in the case of Farm Kid. In the case of Lonnie Walker, we're gonna look at. This farm kid grew up, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, carrying bags of feed, carrying buckets of water, um, doing manual labor, carrying cinder blocks, concrete blocks, stuff along those lines, just doing work, okay? Then we take Lonnie Walker, whose dad had him go to the park and would do, you know, 150, 200 box jumps up the steps, uh, running sprints up the steps, running hill sprints jumping up and touching the net. And he you know, got to the point where he'd have a 40 plus inch vertical. But what happened with both of these cases, you know, one grows up in the farm, one grows up in the city. What happens is that their body, as they go through puberty, is aware that things are happening and that there's some type of load being placed on the individual. Okay, so that load uh, being placed on the individual communicates to physiologically what's known as the muscle spindles or even the Golgi tendon organ. These are, these are essentially like force. Uh, they, they recognize force within joints and within muscles. And when those forces get placed uh, inside of the body, okay, so if you're carrying a load or you're, you're squatting or you're doing jumps, things along those lines, your body starts to be aware of, okay, we've got to recruit these motor units to then fire, to then protect the joint so that we can still move as a human being. We can move, um, Vasu, what's up? We can then move and, and do these things in the future with less of a struggle. Okay. So the adaptation occurs. There's a defensive mechanism where your GTO or your muscle spindles, uh, they're protective, but then they're teaching your body, hey, we need to recruit uh, these high threshold motor units. We need to imprint them long term. We need to, uh, there's potentially a muscular breakdown, so we need to create more myofibers um, so that we can do these tasks in the future with minimal struggle, okay? We want to maintain homeostasis as much as possible. So the farm kid, Lonnie Walker, both have to go through these crazy adaptations based off of the uh, based off the stimuli that they're doing on a regular basis. Okay, and so when they're doing that, that leads to their improvement in their tasks. That leads to their improvement in their rate coding. That leads to their improvement in their overall coordination, and then that in turn transfers really well 
to the sporting world if they go into the sporting world. And in the case of Lonnie, he plays in the NBA. In the case of the other athlete, he ended up playing uh, division or one, yeah, one double A football out in Western PA. He was a really good athlete. Uh, now and now, ironically, he works back for his dad. What's up, Beijing, China? So if we look at that, and where I'm trying to go with this is is the understanding of volume mechanical tension and what that means for adaptation. And now I'm gonna give you my own personal experience um, about why we need to just do simple things like this, okay? So a lot of people will, will say, yo, how do I get stronger? And we actually had a, a business meeting. This is probably going back about two or three weeks ago where our, our video guy, uh, Jason, he and I were in a meeting and we're just talking about um, how, you know, this. the guys that we're talking to, um, we're designing some stuff for us uh, actually around our planner and they brought up, they watched some of our videos and they're like, hey, you know, we just do the 40 pound dumbbells every week when we're pressing. And I, and if you're in my private chat, um, we've talked about this in the private chat a couple different times. So if you guys want to join the channel chat, go ahead and do that because we go into some of this stuff even in more detail. Um, but one of the interesting things was that I said, well, why don't you, you know, are you are you pressing the 45s or the 50s? And they're like, nah, no, nah, we, we don't increase our weight. And so I, I, I brought up uh, a, a story about myself and, and how I got into lifting weights, okay? And so my dad, okay, when, when, when I was growing up, my brother and I would lift weights in, in the garage, okay? That's actually where um, the garage strength title comes from. And so we would lift weights in the garage. My dad would take us out. He showed us how, what we needed to do. Uh, and he got us this jailhouse incline bench. We had a flat bench and we had a, a squat rack that we actually still have downstairs. Um, and he was like, all right, just start lifting. And so he would teach his technique here and there. But most of the time he would just say like, you know, I want to see if you're motivated. I want to see if you want to go out there and train yourself. And so, you know, over time, you know, we would just go out and do our own exercises and we got a little bit stronger, but then he came out and he's like, look, if you hit a bench press, okay, let's use the bench as the example. If you hit a bench press, let's say at 135 pounds or 60 kilos, and you do it for a set of 10, let's just keep everything simple. You do 60 kilos for a set of 10, and you're doing four sets of 10. On your next set, put five pounds on, on each side, okay? Or yeah, five pounds, so that's gonna be 10 pounds total, so five kilos. Just put fives on each side if we're talking about in pounds, so I'm gonna stay with pounds. Okay, so you do another set of 10. You get all 10? Yeah, put another five on. You get nine. Okay, just stay there, do another set. Or drop that off and do another set of 10. Then the next week, and you write that down. So you got your planner, you write down, okay, I did you know 135 pounds by 10, I did 145 by 10, I did 155 by nine, I did 155 by seven. So then my dad would say, all right, the next time that you bench press, start at 140 pounds instead of 135 pounds. And you try to get as many reps as you can at 140 pounds, at 150 pounds, at 160 pounds. And then if you get stuck and you only get five or six reps at 160 pounds, the next week, try and get three or four sets at like 150 to 155 pounds. But the whole story goes back to the basis of progressive overload but in all reality, how physiology adapts, okay? So how our body is adapting from an unconscious perspective, okay? Literally, that's what's happening. We're not telling our body to get stronger. We're just training our body physi physiologically to learn how to recruit accordingly to what the tests are at hand. And the tests at hand, a bench press, a back squat, a clean, a snatch, are tests that transfer to sporting movements. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do at the simplest line, the absolute simplest line. So the next aspect would be, okay, dad, I did four weeks of this or five weeks of this, and I'm only getting 150 for sets of seven or eight. And he would say, okay, now the next thing that you need to do is cut your, cut your reps. Okay, so let's do five sets of five, and you start at 155 pounds. And so you, you get to that point and you build up. And I still remember this, this was all based around my dad had a, at one point told me if I could do 205 for five, I would bench two plates on each side. 
And I remember I kept getting like 185 for five. So I'd get 195 for five, but I put 205 on and I get three. And my whole goal was that in my mind, I couldn't bench the two plates on each side of the bar until I hit 205 for five. So he'd say, okay, well now you do five sets of three and you do them all at 205. Okay, so you do two, 205 for five sets of three. Then you, you do, let's say you do that on a Monday. Then you come in on a Friday, you do that again. Five sets of three at 205, okay? And you do that again, you do that one more time. And then, okay, now, now let's rest for about four days and let's try and bench those two plates. And then you could come in, I came in, bench those two plates. But the whole thing here goes back to the simplicity of just put freaking weight on the bar. Try to increase that volume. Try to increase that mechanical tension. And that's where farm strength comes from. That's where the jumping capability that we mentioned of Lonnie Walker comes from. And then that comes down to, can we place um, a figure or a number on mechanical load, mechanical tension, which leads to volume, which leads to adaptation, which leads to greater increases in strength, greater increases in force and power output, which in turn leads to uh, greater ability in the athletic realm. And I actually, we just broke down Bob Beeman's jump, uh, his long jump uh, world record at the time, an Olympic record still that was set in 1968. And it's probably not going to be broken for a long time. But we even broke down like, what was Bob Beeman doing at a young age? He was sprinting, he was jumping, he was doing just physical things all of the time. And then that led him into the realm of sprints and long jump, and in turn led to him becoming the arguably the greatest long jumper in the history of the world. And so if we are, you know, someone, I see this question, I'm a goalkeeper in Germany, I'm 15, and next year in the, in the Nationals. So if I'm looking at this, I'm looking at, okay, let's use the goalkeeper example. I have a goalkeeper, we have to identify what are the strength characteristics that the goalkeeper needs. The goalkeeper needs to be extremely explosive, okay? Um, they, need to, they need to be uh, as agile as possible, okay? So they have to be able to cut back and forth. So we got to train blast impulse. We've got to train their absolute strength. We've got to get them to do things like plyometrics and stuff along those lines. And then if we work backwards, okay, we have to increase blast impulse. We have to use what's going to increase blast impulse, okay, a power clean. What's going to increase um, your ability to power clean, okay, a back, a back squat, so that's the absolute strength movement. Okay, what's going to increase uh, your sustained impulse, okay, plyometrics. Okay, what's going what's gonna to increase all these things? R2, I saw you picked up uh, the... Uh, a program this morning. I saw that in my emails, R2. Thanks for picking that up. I was wondering what that discount was that you got. <laughs> Best plyometrics for exercise I'll, or for running backs I'll get into. But so now you look at that, that goalkeeper example and you start to break these things down and then you have to look at, okay, so we identified the strength characteristics. We identified the exercises underneath those strength characteristics. Now the next step is introduce that into training. Okay, so then we introduce those exercises into training. And then the next step is we've got to get adaptations. And then the next process is we need to increase volume on a regular basis. And we need to increase that mechanical tension so that your body's forced to make newer and newer and newer adaptations. And that even gets us down in, in, in a rabbit hole of, you know, if we're reading about the, the research around deloads, do deloads work? Yes, they work to a point, but why do they work? They really work from a mechanistic perspective because of the change in volume, not because we're deloading and we're recovering, but more so because there's a change over a you know seven to twenty one day time frame that if you take about a week uh, to to change your your volume and you decrease your volume and then you then your body adapts to that and then you re increase your volume so you let's say you cut your volume and what we do is we cut our volume by about thirty five percent on our deload weeks then we go back and we increase that volume again by about thirty five percent. The deload improves your body, your body's ability to exert force and exert power, mainly because of the change, not because of that rest period or not because of the the ability of, to increase recovery, but because now there's a new stimulus. There's two new stimuli. Okay, so I wanted to go touch on that, and I wanted to show you guys like, look, all this stuff is happening 
physiologically based off of time under tension, based off of explosiveness, based off of uh, being aware of be, you know, your body being aware of load being placed on it through a jump, through a power clean, through a full clean, through a back squat, through range of motion. Okay, so if we are going through these ranges of motion, your body has to adapt to prepare for those ranges of motion. And then we have to look at what ranges of motion transferred best to that specific sport that you're in. If we're using the goalkeeper, we have to think about, all right, well, we actually know that full range of motion back squats and front squats improve vertical jump from a, from a counter movement perspective of only doing a quarter squat. So we have to do full range of motion. We have to do partial range of motion. We have to increase power clean. We have to increase full clean. We have to increase high hang snatch. We have to increase behind the neck jerk. We have to increase agility side to side. We have to train the muscles specifically in an isolated manner to increase the size and strength of those muscles. But then we also have to use reflexive movements to increase their rate of coordination. Okay, so I wanted to cover all that. And then David, you could use a lot of those things I just gave you examples of. Um, and that also will go along the lines of, you know, he's talking about falling on hard turf. If you're uh, an athlete, if you're, let's say you're aging, right? You're 65, 70 years old and you trip and you fall on a curb. Okay, if I trip and I fall on a curb, I'm 65. Let's say I'll use my dad as an example. He's still exercising, he still lifts. He's, he was benching, you know, 70 kilos for like 12. Okay, he's almost 70 years old. If he falls on a curb, falls over, he'll have muscle mass in his shoulder and he'll also have that rate of coordination from training that global innervation. So now he can absorb that fall. And in theory, he'll be less likely to dislocate his shoulder or to break his shoulder. Okay, or to break or to break his humerus. Okay, because he has this this built up uh, muscular area. Okay, so to use David's question about falling on hard turf, if he falls over and lands, my dad in this example, he can protect himself from the fall. Okay, he has he has uh, the defense mechanisms to absorb the blow. It's the same case in football. Okay, when you're making contact with an individual, it's the same case in soccer. If you're falling on um, on hard turf or something along those lines, if you've built up that muscle mass and you've built up those defense mechanisms, your body recruits at high speed and that leads to better force absorption and you learn how to absorb and fall properly and you learn how to handle the different loads. So I wanted to actually even show you guys is that one of the big factors um, inside of peak strength is that now we've got, I'm gonna show you mine here, is that now we have uh, a pretty cool factor, let's go back here, is that we even have inside of peak strength, I'm getting so many text messages, is that we'll have this factor where you can actually see the volume that I'm hitting. Gosh, how many people will text me while I'm trying to show you? You can actually see the tonnage that I lifted. So every single movement, okay, if you see there, 22.63 tons, okay? So I lifted, um, Based off of this new streak, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lower this. How many people can I get text messages from? So I'm going to show you uh, with a little bit more of shade there. If I could show you, all right, I'm lifting this much tonnage today, all right? So I did uh, for every single set, let's say I have 100-pound dumbbells and I do 10 presses. That's 1,000 pounds, okay? So one press, 100 pounds, two press, 200 pounds. So my body... I'm gonna, that's not even a good angle there. Let's see if I can show you from this angle. So my body is going to acknowledge, okay, that we're do lifting this much tonnage. And that's what we're doing up top here inside of peak strength. So now we can monitor what that adaptation period looks like. And then on top of that, we're even going to look at, all right, I'm going to say my current streak is two, two days in a row. So that's going to help hold me accountable. Okay. My total workouts is four. Uh, so that, that I have an idea there and then I'm going to back off. And so today I lifted 7,000 kilograms, you know, so now that's going to lead to a potential milestone. Um, and I'm even going to be able to see what are those new maxes? So you can see here, oh, wow. I hit a power clean or a front squat at 133 kilos for five reps that's telling me that I hit a new estimated one rep max. And that estimated one rep max is based off of the formula that we're putting in to determine uh, where are those reps, 
will help you lead to a better one rep max. You know, in theory, a five rep PR will do that. You know, it, actually, if we go back and think about the example of my dad, yeah, if you hit this for five, you'll be able to hit a, a bench press PR. So that's sort of where we're going with that with that front squat uh, PR. So one of the ma- major factors is as we're trying to increase the functionality of peak strength is that we need to monitor the volume and we need to monitor the mechanical load and the mechanical tension because and by doing so, that's stuff that's going to lead to better performance. And that's also hard. That's going to make your workouts more challenging. Okay. That's why also inside of Peak Strength, you have the thing where you can monitor that that rep scheme was really challenging. That was hard or it was easy. And it brings in auto-regulation for your, from yourself. So you can train Peak Strength to learn how you're handling specific movement patterns and specific exercises with specific load, okay? And then over time, if you do workouts, if you do 75 workouts, we're gonna give you a pat on the back and send you a t-shirt, okay? So then then we send you that freaking sweet t-shirt, but that's motivation to pull you through so that you can attain your peak strength. So I think that's, you know, I wanted to share the physiology side I wanted to show you, you know, the, the examples that we've had. I wanted to share my own examples of volume-based training um, and mechanical tension. And then I wanted to show you inside of peak strength how we're monitoring that load, how we're monitoring those things. So if you guys have peak strength right now, you probably saw it yesterday. I had a couple, um, a couple people, barbell lifter, uh, I'll try to answer that shortly. I had a couple people DM me yesterday on Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram, it's Ghostface D Miller, uh, and ask me, yo, what is it? What does this tonnage mean? How does that? How does that impact uh, what I'm doing? But then also, uh, by following training sessions and holding yourselves accountable to train 75 sessions, you will hit PRs, you will have higher mechanical load, and you will get closer to attaining your goals, and in turn have freaking fun being a good athlete, okay? So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. And even looking at those new established maxes, that's gonna help push yourselves on the on the rep maxes. A lot of people might do drop sets of four or five or six, and they sort of putz through it instead of actually pushing a little bit harder to try and get even more gains, to get even more myofibular hypertrophy um, around those joints that we're training, around those muscles that we're training for David, in his case, as a, as a, as a goalie. Uh, so I wanted to share those questions um, or share those examples and show you guys uh, my, my situation with that new milestone, 20 tons lifted, you know, and, and what that even means. And that means that a lot of people, when they're doing volume, it, they struggle to calculate everything. Um, and even if you bring in, I'm going to show you this on the back end, too, with, a, with an established max. So a lot of people will try to monitor um, their total tonnage. But it becomes a huge pain in the butt to write all that stuff down and to calculate it and to make sure that you're actually doing it accordingly. And so that's why we're doing this for you guys is that now you can actually, let's see if I can pull up an exercise here. So now you guys can actually do that yourselves where you can, you know, you can monitor inside of our app. Okay, so I'm going to show you this too. This is something cool. So let's say we have this movement, a banded dumbbell bench, okay? So I, if I have a banded dumbbell bench, and I hope you can see that based off, there's some glares because it's such a nice day. I got banded dumbbell bench, right? I don't have, let's go into the history. I don't have history entered on this exercise, mainly because I just switched my program because I wanted to demonstrate this, okay? So I don't have the history entered, okay? So one thing I can do is I can enter my one rep max, Okay, so if I go in and I enter my one rep max, let's say my one rep max is 100 pound, or 100 kilos, which that would be really high. Let's say it's 60 kilos. Uh, I'm going to pause on the chest with band. I'm going to save that. That's going to save. Oh, man, that glare is bad. That's going to save as my one rep max. Okay, so now I know that 60 kilograms in each hand is my one rep max PR on dumbbell bench. And now I'm going to train the app. I'm going to train peak strength that in the future, everything should be based off of that maximum. Okay. And that's going to help me make that progress. And then if we go back to understanding the total amount of tonnage lifted, I know what tonnage I need to hit to make that progress on a consistent basis. And a lot of us 
don't hold ourselves accountable with hitting consistent tonnage, with hitting consistent workouts. That's the whole point here is that if you guys train for 75 freaking days and we're monitoring the tonnage well and you're monitoring the feedback really well, you're all going to become stronger. That's the whole goal. That's what's so freaking sweet about peak strength, dude. It's like taking the gym here. It's like taking garage strength and putting it into your hands in Beijing, China, in Germany, in Idaho. Dude, I freaking love it. So It's so cool. Um... Oh, Steve's in here. Ooh, when's the peak planner going to be available? That's a good question that I have. Maybe Jason or Trevor could tune in on that one. <laughs> what was that? Oh, where is it? Oh, we're still working on it and are looking to have it finished in the next few months. There you go, <laughs> Chelsea. Um Power movements for football players. Okay, so power movements for football players. I'm going to say football players are uh, American football. So in that case, hang power clean. Hang full clean. Two box. One box cleans. Okay, one box cleans are great. Uh, another thing I've been hammering is uh, compression, handling compression. Yeah, I actually, again, I, I talked about this, but we just filmed uh, on peak strength. We're going to be releasing um, a Bob Beeman React you know, the greatest long jumper of all time, basically. And we talk about even on his plant, the compression he uses to then sort of spring load out of that jump. And that's one of the big factors with football is in, in doing technical coordination movements like a clean or a snatch is the compression on the catch. Uh, that's, that's a really, really important factor. Um, also, I wanted to tell you guys, I don't know if you saw, that we changed the name of the Masters of Sport podcast now to the Garage Strength Podcast. I'm not sure if we updated the YouTube channel yet, but we are now calling it the Garage Strength Podcast to help you attain that Masters of Sport. Uh, so I wanted to, to let you guys know about that. So Barbell Lifter, how can your theories be best applied to training for powerlifting? Love your videos despite knowing very little, little about Olympic lifting. So I think the theories that we use are very extraordinarily applicable to powerlifting. I would argue that it, it, it's like in the in the simplest form, I would probably argue our methods work probably best in powerlifting is that, you know, we're doing one or two days of pretty heavy freaking lifting. Then we're doing a day of being, of doing an athlete day. So you've got to be explosive in multiple ranges of motion. You've got to train your body to fire at high speeds and to, and to recruit at extraordinarily high speeds. And then we have days of moving things really fast. And then we have other hypertrophy days. And so all of those methods are really, really important. It's just breaking down what are those actual exercises that you're going to be training for um, and, and what are those movement patterns that you need to focus on. Um, so in the case of powerlifting, it'd be deadlift, back squat, bench press, right? And then now we've got to understand what exercises transfer to, to a deadlift. You know, we can go clean pull, snatch pull, snatch deadlift, you know, trap bar deadlift, sumo, conventional, RDLs. And then we, we program based off of that stuff. And so what speeds transfer, what positions, what range of motions, what squats transfer to back squats and to deadlifts, front squats, zombie squats, back squats, high bar, low bar. You know, so all of those things will factor into how we're planning it. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask you guys, what cues do you guys use most frequently in training? Um, if you're, if you're trying to learn something, I'm, 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 I'm thinking, I'm, I'm writing some of these, this, this stuff down on my phone, but I'm also thinking it through, how do you program strength and conditioning for esports? That, man, that's a really great question, but I think how, how, there is a powerlifting program on the website, Steve, there's a deadlift program, uh, on the website. If Jason could put that in, you could pick that up and that will be in peak strength in the fall. Um, so Strength and conditioning for esports to me would come down to one a lot of tests done uh, on unstable surfaces. We've got a lot. We got to have a lot of reaction and speed. So a lot of plyometric work, but also like brain tests. So I like the idea of PVC pipe walks with the balloon, um, and and even going down to um, if we have better posture while we're sitting. Uh, typically, we can solve tests a lot quicker. I would even hammer with esports uh, consumption of water on you know about, about, probably about every 25 to 40 minutes. 
about seven and a half to 10 ounces of water because that can improve your cognitive ability. Um, and even doing different mobility exercises, long duration squats, stuff like that is where I would see that playing a major role in improving esports uh, performance. Uh, zombie squats would be, so if we look at the difference, the zombie squat would be holding it like this, okay, here, and our arms are out like a zombie. A front squat would be, we hold the barbell in that clean rack position. So that's, that's another factor, uh, that I would, that I would bring up. Oh shoot. Okay. So our esports, yeah, I was not clear on, yeah, I wasn't clear if that, I, I thought, Keith, you were asking for esports as in video games, not extreme sports. So maybe clarify. How should we be plyo training? So how many reps and sets and how much time of rest? Two to three minutes. Yes, mobility would make you faster for sure. Uh, two to three minutes or two to three yeah, minutes of rest for plyometric exercises. I like to program a bilateral movement and a unilateral jump together and then take that two to three minutes rest. Again, that would be something that you would see I'll show you here. Uh, maybe I should just show you my, my uh, you know, this would be my athlete day um, right here. Okay, so this would be, you know, pogo jumps. We got pogo jumps. We've got single leg, uh, leg extensions, fast. Skips for height. Okay, skips for height is a great one. Single leg bounds. Okay, so that would be side band walks. That would be how I would program, and this is for a distance runner, for me running long distance now. That would be an example of, uh, okay, so eSports for video games. That would be an example of a plyometric training day. And Simus, that's in, uh, that's in peak strength. That's athlete day in peak strength. Again, you guys, dude, you guys can go. I would do this. Go to peakstrength.app. Download this for Simus or anybody else or, or uh, the goalie that we were talking to earlier. Get the app. You get seven free days of training. That's five workouts for free. Okay, then you can see the functionality. You can see how we're monitoring volume. Uh, you can start chipping away at that 75 workout so, uh, so you can get a free t-shirt and you can hold yourself accountable. And if you don't like it, you just cancel it during those first seven free days. Cancel it during those days at any time, okay? But I would, I would do it because now, basically you've got me in your pocket telling you what to do. You gotta hold yourself accountable. And that's what all this stuff comes back to is what, when I was using that example, uh, R2, let me answer the, this uh, shortly. I was, I was, being held accountable essentially by my dad, like put more weight on the freaking bar, go out and train, you know, do your workouts properly, make sure that you're lifting properly, make sure that you're doing these movements, you're doing these movements, you're doing these movements, and you're doing these movements properly. And you do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. Um, one of our guys that is in the private chat, again, you guys can sign up for the private chat and become a channel member. Um, and it's basically me and like eight other people is you guys can, you know, it's this guy that we're talking about has been training for 23 weeks on peak strength. And it's like, okay, if you can train in a system for four or five, six years, you know, we're, we just released that video yesterday of Sam Mattis. He's the number three discus thrower in the world currently today at this very moment based off of his performance over the weekend. And you guys got a peek into his entire workout. You know, you got video. Uh, you got a video of Sam training based off of peak strength. What he's doing with his workouts. How he's the number three guy in the world right now, today. You know, April eleventh, twenty twenty three, in the discus throw. He's one of the strongest guys in the world, and he's been training with me since twenty sixteen. Okay, so that's twenty sixteen, right? How many years? That's seven years of training, and he's twenty nine years old right now. So that's like that puts it in perspective of how long you can train, how long you can go through a system, how long you can develop, and how long it takes to, to attain that peak strength. Uh, so R2, he's asking, what's the best plyo exercise for a running back? I think some of the best stuff you can do would be champion strides. So single leg bound, single leg bound, jump cut, single leg bound, other leg, single leg bound, other leg, jump cut to the other leg. Um, a hide and jump, so uh, depth drop, bound, Bound forward, uh, hurdle hops, S uh, single leg stair jumps. Those are the best ones right there. Right there, you got it. Plyo workouts without any equipment. Dude, that's another thing. Okay, I'm really going to be plugging the peak strength here um, for this one. One of the coolest parts here is that, okay, we got pogo jumps. This is for Killer Queen Cage. 
We got pogo jumps, okay? So that doesn't really require equipment, right? Body weight, okay? So now let's do this. Let's go into skips for height. Well, that's, that's body weight. Single leg bounds, body weight. Um, side band walks, you need a band. So if we would go into single leg leg extensions, I'm not sure if this would have a replacement exercise that would be body weight. Let me look. Um, sled pushes. Now th this would be, you would require some, some extra or some piece of equipment to do, but you can actually see a uh, pogo jumps, skips for height, single leg bounds right there. You got three movements, killer queen that do not require any equipment. And actually those are inside of peak strength. So, um, that's a great question though. A lot of, a lot of people ask that question, um, how to, how to train that stuff without, you know, without equipment. I just saw that you guys can see Nicholas over there. Can see Nicholas up there. Actually just hit me up yesterday. Have you thought programs around old dudes coming out of retirement looking to get back into strength? Yeah, David. So we've got two things on the forefront that we're working through. How to prevent or start building workout volume to prevent tendon issues. Yes. Um, I'm going to write this down. Okay, coming back. Let's say a comeback, comeback workout. But David, what I would do is in one, you could get peak strength and then you could just say that you're a novice. So you're starting a new, right? You're a novice. So you, you download uh, peak strength and you get it and you go, all right, I'm, I'm, be I'm a beginner. So you actually tell it, I'm a beginner and I want to go easy. I'm only going to train three days a week. That's what I would do. And then you do that for four to six weeks, and then you get to intermediate, and you just slowly build that up. Um, now, one of the other factors that we have on the forefront is we're going to be coming out with athletic fitness um, and, uh, and bodybuilding as well. So athletic fitness is a, is a way for like someone like myself. Um, Rulon Gardner is not making a comeback. Get out of here, Steve. I don't buy that. He's got to be 50 plus. Uh, <laughs> that's got to be a joke. Um, but athletic fitness would essentially be like, one day I want to do cardio. One day I want to do plyometrics. One day I want to do bodybuilding. And that's going to be programmed into peak strength to, to lay that out for you guys, uh, especially somebody who's coming back. Uh, what about exercises for two to three times a week strength routine for rugby? Uh, exercises for two to three times a week for Trevor. Um, let's do a pause below the knee power clean. Let's do, he's 52. Let's do single leg squats, five sets of five each leg, and then let's do Nordic hamstring curls and walking lunges. That's, that's a, a, a workout that you can do today uh, for rugby. Um, Steve, that's wild. What is Rulon Gardner coming out of retirement for? There's got to be heavyweights better than him. He's 52. Went on a rampage and bought a lot of strength programs from you. How does your written pre-written pre programs compare to the Peak Strength app? You're running through the football and sprint power programs. Okay, so Johan's asking, we still have those PDFs up on the website versus peak strength. I would say, um, so is knees over toes guy stronger? The people want to know. I, yeah, he's back. He's probably stronger than me backwards right now. I, I'll give him that. Um, I would say the pre-written programs, the cool part about them is that you can see it all laid out in, in this big plan, right? And you can see the whole thing through. But the downfall is that the PDFs aren't intuitive. They don't learn. They don't provide a rep. They don't provide a rest period. Um, they don't have the auto regulation factored in from the algorithm that we've programmed. Um, they don't have the tonnage monitored that you have inside of peak strength. You don't have the accountability factor from how many days have you been working out. Um, so I think that I think that that's like some of the big factors that I would look at that peak strength offers is that peak strength can monitor you, what you're doing with your rest. It can help you be more accountable as an individual. It can monitor your total tonnage, which as we talked about earlier is a huge factor in your adaptations. Um, and then it, and then it records your best and it can, it can influence or it can teach you when you've hit, when you've hit that, that new standard, it, it tells you, Hey, we've hit this new standard. Um, yeah, that's, that, that would be my answer to that, Johan. Young suit. When we got to see you, Duncan, man, I, I think that, what are GAA sports? What, I don't know what GAA sports are. For me, dunking wise, you know, I've been running quite a bit. I still have some pretty good hops. I have been jumping again quite a bit more, but 
I, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to. I think I still would have to lose a bit more. Are cricket programs available on peak strength? Yes. So if you would go in, um, Doctor Jacob Gooden, I texted you this morning. I hope you got that text message. So if I would go into my program, I don't really want to build a new program because I'm going to lose my some of my stuff. Um, let's say that if I look at cricket, okay, so I look at cricket the exact same way I would look at like baseball. Okay, so I would go into, and this is for that question there. Um, let's go back, shoot. Program. I'd come in here, okay, and I could see right there, okay? So for that question, you see cricket. I hope you can see it without the glare. I would click on cricket, okay, and then I would set up my new program, okay? I'm going to try and hopefully I don't lose. Yeah, good, I did not lose my, my workout. So you can see that tonnage that I hit. So that would be the, the main thing that I would focus on is... Uh, Inside, we've got, I think there's 34 different sports, and we're just adding new sports. I think in June or July is when our next update is to add new sports. So uh, that's, you know, that's what we're doing in there. Um, R2 coming in with, what are the most important elements that running backs should definitely have? Uh, Sandy, Jason, NSCA. So the most important elements that, that someone has to have to become, you know, a world-class top of the line running back like Nick would be you've got to be strong you got to be able to cut really quickly you've got to have blast impulse right so we've got to think about that we got to train blast impulse we got to train sustained impulse we have to train speed so we've got to do our speed based training um, so then we look at back squats front squats single leg squats power cleans full cleans full snatches those are going to be all those aspects to to develop underneath there but then you also have to understand you know if we're um if we're training that stuff we also have to know the game right we've got to be able to pick up blitzes we have to be able to understand defensive schemes so there's a lot of technique involved when we're looking at at a sport like football especially as a running back you're such a key player as far as on the offensive, but also as far as protecting the QB so the QB can make good decisions. So you've got to understand those aspects as well. Quinn, play club soccer in spring and high school football. How can I train for both sports and stay properly conditioned? I do, uh, I would try to maintain your maximal strength, your absolute strength training as much as possible in the spring. Try to increase uh, your lean muscle mass. So get a little bit more muscular, gain a little bit of weight without gaining uh, unnecessary unnecessary uh, weight gain um, and make sure I'd say during the club soccer season that you're still doing some of that long steady state work. Uh, killer queen, big forearms. I've got those big forearms. Big forearms would be to me, hammer curls. If you want to do this fast three days a week, hammer curls, reverse forearm roller, um, reverse curl, um, hang off of a bar for two minutes, you know, three days a week. I think those are going to be the, the big ones that you can that you could use on a regular basis. Hurling and football is hurling like Gaelic, Gaelic is that that Gaelic sport? Um, is that what that is? Best program for AFL. I don't know what AFL is. Is that is that ultimate frisbee? Um, I'm not sure what AFL is. Is it some type of football? Is that ultimate frisbee? Uh, let me know what that would be. Um, that was the same thing with that GAA. What's GAA? Calx XD. What's GAA? I'm not really sure what those are. Okay, so I play Ultimate Frisbee, which is more endurance and skills based on how much training should be weight room and how much should be intense practice. I always think when you're looking at something that is much more focused on technique, let's use Ultimate Frisbee. Let's use even baseball. If you can get into the weight room three days a week, okay, if I could train three days a week and hold myself accountable to do that, all of the time, okay, every single week, three days a week, that should be enough for a sport like soccer, a sport like baseball, and a sport like ultimate frisbee. I would say you could add that fourth day because now if you add in that fourth day, you're adding in uh, ultimate or you're adding in impulse day, okay, so you're going to have two days that are really focused on athleticism and two days focusing on more strength and more power output. So that's, that's how I would fit factor that out is looking at it. Can I do that three days a week? 
can I hold myself accountable in my scheduling to do that three days a week? And that's another big factor is that, dude, a lot of you guys like to make excuses about not, I don't have enough time to get into the gym. I don't have enough time to work out. I don't have enough time to do this. Well, you have enough time. You're just not organizing your day effectively. And you've got to organize your day. You've got to organize your week to get into the weight room, to make sure that you're making those improvements, to challenge yourself to make those adaptations so that you can be healthier and be stronger and improve in your sport or even just improve with your general work capacity. So I I did want to bring that up. For tennis, what are the key differences in training that would be different from how you train a basketball player or a boxer? Um, Oh, Australian football. Yeah, Australian football to me would be uh, very similar to how I would train a rugby player. Um, what groups, muscle groups are most for training wrestling and other martial arts? Lats, lats, trunk, back, hamstrings. Uh, so tennis to basketball, tennis to basketball. I would look at tennis is so much like side to side work and so is basketball, but not nearly to the extent. Uh, so training a lot of glutes and quads, ankle mobility, ankle stability, uh, would be a key factor with tennis. Also shoulder health. Um, focusing on shoulder health, doing a lot of pull-ups, doing a lot of unique plyometric work. And then uh, to basketball, more so unilateral work with basketball. Um, We still would be training the upper body, a lot of dumbbell presses, a lot of pull-ups. Tennis, we're going to be doing a lot of reflexive movements. I would say tennis players need to do more technical coordination movements like power cleans and power snatches. Um, I, I would go through all of those different factors I always thought this, and I've said this in past um, lives, and, and I'll, I'll just hammer this home, is that if you look at tennis and badminton, there's not a single other sport that transfers better to playing middle linebacker. Okay, so middle linebacker in American football is like the, the linchpin of the defense. He's making all the calls. He's making all the reads. He's seeing what the offense is doing, what their tendencies are, and they've got to scrape all down and back on the field with a tremendous amount of speed and tennis transfers extraordinarily well to that lateral motion that that those linebackers are going to need um best cardio that i would recommend long steady state if you're doing resistance-based training this is for giovanni um if you're doing resistance-based training okay so if you're lifting weights three to four days a week i would do some easy steady state 130 beats per minute Zone two, get in that zone two once or twice a week. It's easy, 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, Got tennis elbow from snatching, any tips to avoid it? Uh, More tricep work, more miracle grows, some forearm work, um, you know, doing like dumbbell rotations like this, really, really slow. But again, miracle grow real, real slow, eccentric, and make sure that when you're warming up for your snatches that you're warming up properly with some banded work. Explosive core, really possible without the gym? I think it's it's possible but you've got to be using uh, throwing movements to, to train that, that aspect. Um, I had no football experience, and the coach said, look at this guy's feet, and he moved me into linebacker. I wanted to play wide receiver. So young suit must have been a, a tennis player, I would assume, is what you were playing prior. Uh, GAA is an Irish sports. Hurling is like lacrosse and field hockey in one. I, so I have seen uh, hurling, um, and I have seen, I'm pretty sure I've seen the Gaelic sport uh, played Football's like NFL and soccer. Yeah, I, I need to, to watch that a little bit more. I, I One thing we're trying to do is we're trying to grow our other channel, uh, Peak Strength. And we just did a Kabaddi, uh React, which is like a wrestling capture the flag uh, Indian sport. That's absolutely crazy. You guys should go, should go check that out um, on Peak Strength. But maybe we should even react to I've been thinking about uh, what's the other one I brought up to Jason actually yesterday. I think it's called Calcio... Florentino, which is a type of crazy, crazy rugby fist fight. Uh, that's a that's a it's a native sport to uh, Italy, and and I think that hurling and, and Gaelic football is something similar that we could do a react to. Uh, just interesting sports. It's like swinging, you know. Interesting sports that uh, that a lot of a lot of other people may not know that are really fun to watch once you realize what the game is. Um, have you ever dealt with shin splints during plyometrics? So, yes, actually, I did listen to that, the JPEG Mafia, Danny Brown. I've only listened to it a couple times, but I'd have to look and see which songs I've saved. Let me look. Um, 
as the best. Hopefully I can access this. But while I'm while I'm looking for this, best supplements for soccer, I'd say uh, creatine. Creatine, there's a brand new research paper on creatine and, and endurance. Um, so that's a big one. That's a big one that I think that you, you should pay attention to. Also creatine with power output. Okay, that's another that's another big one um, uh, that that it helps with. Uh, Scaring the hose is the the album. Yeah, I just have like fentanyl fentanyl tester, uh, muddy waters on here, um, and then God loves you, run the jewels. Ironically, run the jewels is a song on there. Ironically, I am wearing my run the jewels shirt. Um, shin splints during plyometrics. Yeah, well, I always do that. That's the whole goal of my music selection. Ooh, Deshaun Morris, what's up? Qu question, best meals to gain weight. Uh, best meals to gain weight would be, again, caloric uh, caloric surplus. Okay, so if you can tolerate milk, that's an easy way to get a large amount of, of calories. I would, I always like to add something like almond butter, cashew butter, peanut butter, uh, butter in general, like a, on a sweet potato, an easy add-on that's dense with calories. So that would be, you know, let's say, let's say your base meal is chicken, broccoli, sweet potatoes. That's a base meal. That's extraordinarily healthy. If you ate that meal, the rest of your life and just that meal, you'd be lean. Okay. You'd be shredded. Now to make that meal uh, and you, let's say you consume it with water or kombucha, right? Now to make that meal better to gain weight, I would look at I'd add almond butter to uh, the sweet potato. I'd put butter on the sweet potato. I would turn that chicken into steak because steak's a little bit more calorically dense because it has a little bit more fat. I'd put butter on top of the broccoli or, or I'd put cheese on top of the broccoli. And then I would add milk instead of water. And then in that milk, I would put whey protein. So I always like to look at meals as this is the base meal. This is how you're going to be healthy and lean, Okay. But then how can we make that healthy lean meal more for caloric surplus? Hopefully that helps, Deshaun. Um, going back to one question, the shin splints. I think a lot of stuff you can do with shin splints and, and jumping is, one, make sure that you're warming up with the PVC pipe walks. Uh, I actually just got a DM today. A guy over in Fiji sent me a couple videos of them doing snatches, and they're doing PVC pipe walks. Uh, and they're snatching in their bare feet because they're literally outside while they're training. So my my comment to to you with the with the jumps is make sure that you're warming up on the PVC pipe. That's going to help with your stability in your ankle and in through your knee joint. Um, also doing things like toe walks, heel walks, uh, tibialis curls. That's going to help as well. Use that as a warm up uh, to try and do that. Got your racing uh, to try and get rid of those those shin splints. Just asked. Uh, changing back squat to front squat on block two of garage strength squat program. What do you think? I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Let me know how it works. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why that uh, Rulon Gardner is going to try and make another run at the Olympics. Uh, should wrestlers try to bulk during the off season? That is my goal. Got you racing. So we're going to come out. We're coming out with a wrestling video. Uh, I think at the end of April um, on off season training, and I think that it's okay to bulk. But do it within reason. You know, 400 caloric surplus every day. You know, at the end of the week, if you added up all of your, your bulking calorie surplus, I wouldn't go much more than 2,000 to 2,400 calories in a week because uh, you don't want to get too husky uh, and increase too many weight classes unless you're growing and you're getting extraordinarily strong. Um, what drills or cues do you use? Yeah, it is, Steve. Uh if you see Steve, and if you guys see Steve in the chat there, so Steve is a channel member. So channel members mean it's 10 bucks a month. Every Friday we do a public live. Uh, you can join the, the channel membership for 10 bucks, and, and we can we can talk about training. Tommy Frazier coming in. Wasn't Tommy Frazier a QB at Nebraska back in the day? Conjugate or linear method for football off-season programming. Parabolic periodization for, for football off-season. You got to pick up garage strength program design, Tommy. That's going to help you the most with that off-season gains. What age is it okay to take supplements? There's actually been some research of like 10 to 12-year-olds taking creatine to help with ADD. Um, it's extraordinarily safe. 
extraordinarily safe. So when you're doing that, consult your doctor first and then, you know, just be aware it can help with certain other aspects that are cognitive. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. It is an extraordinarily safe, um, extraordinarily safe supplement. I also wanted to go into, um, yeah, a couple other factors. I just wanted to share all that stuff around, uh, around volume. And I just, Sean, I, I wanted to see, did you, were you able to see what we were talking about, um, with the peak strength stuff? Cause I know you guys had asked about, um, peak strength training, um, and the, the volume based stuff that, that we put out there, uh, they beat Americans in all sports. That's not necessarily accurate. They didn't beat Bob Beeman at the Olympics in 1968. They actually got curb stomped by him, Miles, so that's not accurate. <laughs> uh, tips or exercises to fix severe wrist pain when clean or front squat. I would work on mo mobility through the lats, mobility through the wrist, uh, elbows. Um, yeah, and I would just... Dylan, one thing you can also do is back off of cleans for the time being and just focus on your snatches and that leads into alexander's question of what are my thoughts on snatching in the weight room i think they're fantastic i think especially if you're making contact you're focusing on catching deep uh you're improving that hip mobility could you use a foam roller instead of a pvc pipe you can but it's a little bit softer on your feet and it's and it flattens the best part about the pvc pipe uh, is that it, it forces your foot to mold to it and to actually hold and like hug it and your your toes start to act as fingers. That's the main goal there. Uh, so that would be my argument. Deshaun, yes, we did. I played around more on the app, but it makes sense. Thanks for checking up on that. Yeah, so guys, the the and this is just Deshaun, we talked about this a little earlier. It was around the volume uh, and the tonnage. And if we can increase that tonnage slowly over time, we're going to get stronger. Uh, if we hold ourselves accountable and if we monitor the intensity of the workouts and even those rep maxes, monitoring those rep maxes, that's just going to help us uh, focus more on training. Also, there's going to be, for you guys out there, there's going to be this, the end of this week when we're, our next YouTube video, we're going to talk about that release of this, okay? So next week, this swole shirt, Okay, in the video, you're going to be eligible to win that swole shirt for free. So what we're going to do is that if you watch this coming, the next video that's coming out, if you comment and you subscribe to the channel and you have all notifications on, and then you come to next week's public live, we're going to announce who's winning that swole t-shirt and then how you can go about uh, getting that swole t-shirt. Aaron, what drills cues do you use for developing developmental sprinters and understanding proper max speed technique and track? Is this Aaron Gadsden? That's a really complex question. Um, <sighs> proper max speed mechanics. So I think some of the stuff that we'll do is like hip lock position work, dumbbell snatches to a hold. Uh, I like to focus on stability in dorsiflex positions um, when when you're holding that that position. Um, <laughs> uh, Sam Weeks' Triumph is 100% my favorite Wu-Tang song. I don't think that, you know, I know it's a pop song. I know it's popular, like, it, but I, I don't think there's a, it, you know, it's like Olympic torch flaming, burn so sweet. The thrill of the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. That 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 lyrics. Oh, geez, young Gravel Pit's a good song. Come on, um, those lyrics to me ring. They ring so so true in my life and in training and with athletes and with life in general. Like I mentioned, uh, it's just. It's dealing with the agony of defeat. It's it's dealing with the 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 flame, the the power inside of you, uh, burning all of all of the time. Uh, yeah, there's no chorus. It's it's just an absolute, and it's just the beats, the beats, the the rhythm. And and each rapper comes in at their own time, and then they contribute to what triumph is. And I think that that. To me, I, I, I don't think that that you yeah I think Bad Allen is great. I don't think that you're gonna find a, a better. I mean, dude, Wu Tang's got probably fifty five legit songs. Um, sorry, I went off on that a little bit after we were talking about uh, Aaron's question. So Aaron's question was max speed mechanics. Um, again, I like doing hip lock work. I like doing some trunk work. I like doing 
Uh, I think there's certain bounds that can help uh, with max speed mechanics. I like grounding, dorsiflexed as much as possible with a slight elevation of the heel, um, that upright trunk. Uh, I think that, and, and then just beating that home with the athletes is like, look, when we're running at 40, 50, 60 yards, that's what we're looking at. Um, thoughts on stretching. Should we do a dumbbell, uh, one to two, one to two a week, three to four times a week or every day? I think you should stretch four to five times a week. I think you should do any, even using the mobility inside the app. I think that, that you should be stretching four to five times a week, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Socrates philosophies and hypotheses. Yeah, I, I think that's the other big part around Wu Tang. And, and even what's interesting is that Wu Tang, like the actual Wu, uh, stands for something in Confucianism around like uh, the spirit of people and, and unity. And then they, they have so much information around chess and around life and around how to deal with struggle. Um, that's why I love them. And actually, that's why, I mean, uh, I think it's just studying, it's studying stuff like this all the time. And that's what leads you to just constantly want to get better. And I actually think going back to those lyrics from Triumph, um, Olympic, ta uh, Olympic torch flame and burn so sweet, right? It's like, how do you, how do you find that strength inside of you to attain that peak strength to tie everything together, right? Uh, DBM and defensive back, but I got, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You got it. Deshaun. Are you still pushing and pulling a sled? Yes, I do still push and pull a sled. Strengthening Achilles tendonitis. Um, PVC pipe walks. I like switch lunges with the back foot, with a foot staying planted on, on that PVC pipe. I think that helps with that, that ankle stability as well. I signed up for Wu Chess uh, in 2008. Very poor use of my money on my end. Um, that's funny. From Young Sweet. Young Suit. Um, is Wiz Khalifa from PA? I don't know if that's accurate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little check on that, Miles. I'm not sure if that is accurate. Um, let me look that up quick. Yeah, what's interesting, you guys are asking these questions, and we're actually, we're actually, working, through, um, we're actually working through some different T-shirts uh, that sort of... No, he was born in North Dakota? Wiz Khalifa was born in North Dakota? That's wild. Um Okay, so his hometown, though, he moved to Pittsburgh. And that's like, Mac Miller's from Pittsburgh, too. Uh, so Wiz Khalifa moved to Peaburg. Uh, and I wonder if, I didn't look further, but I wonder if he and, maybe they, they grew up together or something. Because uh, that's also where Mac Miller's from. Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll stop talking about that stuff. Okay. Uh, I'll take one more question, and then i got to head out to throws practice. Have you seen Charlie Francis' motor unit involvement diagram? I do, and I like it quite a bit. Um, do I agree that you shouldn't always do clean snatching without doing the main compound movements? I don't think that's necessarily true, uh, but I think that I still like the, the, the involvement diagram quite a bit. It's really, really good and thought out. And I think that's one thing that we lack here at Garage Strength is like, dude, diagrams like that are so easy to visualize what people are saying about a complex uh, discussion on motor units. And so I think that, um, uh, I, th I think that that, I'm still reading your guys' comments on, on the hip hop. Um, I think that those diagrams make complex thoughts easier to digest. And that's one thing I think we could do a better job with in our social media for you guys to understand. One more, actually. Alicia, I want a workout routine from your body weight. I'm 6'2", 330. What's the price and what's your website or IG? Uh, Instagram is ghostface D Miller, D Miller, or go to garagestrength.com. Garagestrength.com. I'm really struggling with Nordic curls. Do you have a good base? To... Okay, so let's start. Let's do a progression to Nordic curls. Progression to Nordic curls would be starting with leg curls, starting then getting into sliding leg curls with hip extension, then getting into glute ham, then getting into razor curls, then Nordic curls with slow eccentric with a band. All right, I'm gonna head out. This is a great, great live, YouTube live. I love it. We're gonna be back next Tuesday. Don't forget about the, the shirt deal, so pay attention to this week's uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube video coming up at the end of the week. Um, also don't forget about that lesson around volume, mechanical tension, 
and, and, and that accountability, the more mechanical tension that you have over 75 to 100 days, the stronger you're going to get, the greater strength adaptations. And you can see that that's going to be tracked inside of Peak Strength. So if you guys head over to peakstrength.app, if you're not in there already, you get seven free days of training. Um, if you don't like it, you can cancel it any time. But if you cancel it, you're not going to attain that peak strength. Vasu, thanks for tuning in. And, and Steve, I'll see you guys on Friday. If there's anything you want me to talk about on Friday in the private, um, you can comment below or send me an email. Send that email to support if there's specific topics that you want me to go deeper in depth on. Um, and also, I'll see you guys next time. Don't forget to cultivate your power. Peace. Peace out, freaks.